Okay, we're back live again. Uh, Jason, we're ready to roll <clears throat> with the Biotech Academy from Northwest. Okay, we're ready to roll, Jason. Okay, Thank sorry. You. All right. Um, last item for me is uh, uh, something we're really excited about, the Northwest Cabarrus High School Biotech Academy. Um, and I want to um, take an opportunity to kind of couch this under a broader vision for our high schools um, in Cabarrus County. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a broad vision here. The, uh, we have a vision for a comprehensive initiative at our high schools. And what you've seen in some of the documents is that we've been able to put in place some academy-like programs at some of our high schools. So for example, Concord High School has a fire academy that's been started. Um, we have the STEM, obviously, at Central Cabarrus that is heavy into that field. And then we also have at Hickory Ridge uh, High School, we have a, um, a really robust um, culinary arts program that students take advantage from across the county. And what we want to do is build on that and, and bring that under a, an initiative that we would call Diploma Plus. Um, and what we find is increasingly, um, as you're aware, a high school diploma is not enough. Okay, to, to be successful in the current job market. In addition, uh, we have employers that are demanding that their wor workforce is both intellectually capable, uh, but also has this necessary practical hands-on experience. Um, and traditionally in our high schools in America, we have done a very good job of sorting students. Uh, we've said to some students, uh, you're an academic, you need to go over here and take academic classes. And you're, uh, you're not an academic, you need to take hands-on classes. Um, and that's worked for a period of time in our country, but increasingly we're finding that that's not working anymore. I'm going to share two stories with you that I think highlight um, this move to kind of have a diploma plus something else. Um, in our uh, outreach to the business community, uh, two weeks ago I had the opportunity to sit down with the CEO of an engineering company, and he said, you know what the best engineer is for me? It's the farmer, the farmer's kid that grew up on a farm and then went to NC State. Okay, or it's the kid that worked on cars his whole life and then went to NC State and got an engineering degree. Those kids are invaluable to me because they graduate with an engineering degree, but they also have this really practical experience. Like they know how to take apart a car, they know how to drive a tractor, they know how to do a lot of hydraulics. They've got this practical, hands on experience that is invaluable. He said, compare that to an engineer that graduates from NC State that has none of that experience. Um, I have to do a lot of training, I have to, I have to teach them a lot of stuff just about how things work, um, even though they have the same degree from NC State University. On the flip side, I was talking to a manager of a um, manufacturing company, and you know what the manufacturing industry is saying? It takes more than a high school diploma to run some of these machines that we do in manufacturing. It's not just go work on the line um, of a previous generation. And so these students who are graduating with a high school diploma and expect to go to work in a manufacturing industry um, need to be able to uh, think at a very high level. And so everybody kind of needs both of those skills. And that's what we think Diploma Plus is going to uh, really reach out and try to do. Um, you, you see some of the ones we're looking at um, for many of our, our schools. Um, they're kind of built on the premise of, of trying to accomplish four different things. Um, the first thing is going to be what we would call a four plus one approach. Okay, So we have an early college where our students can graduate from high school with a high school diploma and a full associate's degree from RCCC. This would be similar to that but um, take a little bit more time. So they would graduate from these academies with one full year of an associate's degree under their belt. In this case, a biotech associate's degree from Rowan uh, Cabarrus Community College. They would then be able to matriculate up to RCCC and in one year graduate with their um, associate's degree. Not two years, but one year. Okay? In addition, that same student who maybe does not want to attend the community college would be able to take those course credits um, and go to a four-year university and enter that four-year university with a full year of college under their belt or the credits that are equivalent to, um, to the ones that they've taken in partnership with RCCC. Um, we hope that the, this, these Diploma Plus programs would have strong business collaboration and would include an internship and a capstone experience for our students. Um, and, and also, these uh, Diploma Plus academies would carry a special designation on the diploma in keeping with the governor's new um, initiative to have uh, kind of career endorsements on, on the diploma. So it kind of fits under that overarching goal from the governor. At Northwest Cabarrus High School in particular, um, 
we're, we're in the development of stages of this program. Um, we're developing the sequences. We're working with uh, RCCC to develop those partnerships. Um, in many ways, this is a win-win for the community college. So imagine if we have 100 kids taking a community college course. The community college um, provides that instructor, instructor to teach those students, um, and they get the funding for those students. Likewise, we get the funding for those students, but we're not paying for the teacher to instruct that particular course potentially. So it's a win-win for them as well, and, and as you know, they are highly competitive and want as many students in their, in their programs as possible as well. Um, yeah, I want to I let Mike come up and talk a little bit. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot here. Um, he, he's, he wants to, I want to talk, him to talk a little bit about why he's excited about the program. Again, I want to emphasize that... Um, this is in development. We are in the early stages. We have a strong team at, at Northwest Cabarrus High School that's working on it. I'm very excited about it, but he can speak more to that. Good evening. And we are very excited at Northwest Cabarrus about this opportunity. So many things that, that have been discussed tonight uh, about the current job market and the economy, uh, competitiveness with charter schools. This is, this is yet another choice in Cabarrus County for high school students that make us um, the best, make us a great option. Um, I'm, I'm a father of two young daughters that are going to go to school in Cabarrus County Schools, and I want them to have options just like you guys, our parents, want all your students to have options. Um, just some of the things, we look at, at biotechnology, uh, almost a, a quarter million jobs have been created in North Carolina uh, in the biotechnology field or, or related fields to it. Um, the average salary uh, last year was $78,000 for somebody working in that, and I think that's incredible. Um, mm -hmm. The skills that these kind of programs build, because there are biotech academies in other states that we've looked at. There's some in California and some in um, some of the north, northeastern states. The communication, the collaboration, the ethics, the lab skills, the research skills, data analysis, technical writing, all these 21st century skills that our students have to have to be successful when they go to a four-year college, community college, or go to a, a career right out of high school. They have to have these things. And when you look at the mission statement in Cabarrus County Schools, one of the first things it says is globally competitive lifelong learners. And you talk about being globally competitive, it's having these skills that this kind of program is going to offer. So we're excited about that. Uh, Mr. Van Heuklen mentioned the internships that will be available, the, um, the capstone project, and seeing, seeing all the, a lot of the great things that students did a few years ago with the graduation, excuse me, with the graduation project. Capstone is um, something they, they take as a senior that will kind of be their, their year-long project in a certain specialized area that, that they've been focusing on. They maybe did an internship in, and um, that will show that they would – it will show a, a, the culmination of all the skills that they've learned in the four years of the biotech courses. And if I could add to that, that we, we have a Capstone project at the STEM high school. Um, the IB program at Concord has a similar project that's um, kind of a culminating – event for the students. So it's, it's a, a way to kind of wrap up their career under that umbrella of biotech or STEM or whatever. Many times it also includes a partnership with, a, with industry. And then there's other things, the, uh, the field trips that are, that are in, you know, we're so close to the, research, mm -hmm. the North Carolina Research Campus that they offer. There's so many opportunities, uh, summer programs that are two weeks long, three weeks long, or even shorter, some day programs for students to be a part of. So there's just a lot of opportunities for our students to go out and get um, real-world education, learn real-world applicable skills. Um, the community partnerships with RCCC and the Research Campus, uh, CMC, you know, we look at, there, there's so many possibilities for our students that, and, and all the students in Cabarrus County that can be involved in this type of program. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, and last thing before we take uh, questions, just to kind of give you an idea of the funding. Um, and when I first kind of started asking, like, what's this going to cost? Um, once we started to get into some of the equipment that it's going to cost, um, it quickly ballooned. So, you know, we have an itemized list of, of what, we, what we would have to purchase in order to get that. Um, and, you know, you're looking at all this science equipment, um, micro pipettes, um, all, you know, all kinds of stuff here. And I can get that for you. But um, I'm, I'm sure you have questions on the on the funding. But I have it here in a paper document. I don't have that online for you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jason. Any that, questions? That's uh, just another one of our wonderful programs that we're going to try to get instigated here and get started. But uh, we'll start with the board's questions. But yeah. one question that I have, uh, Mike, you had mentioned it would be available to all students in Cabarrus County. So the students that's A.L. Brown, could they come to this STEM program? I mean, to this uh, to this. Uh, Biotechnology Academy. They they would have to go through the same and correct me if I'm wrong. The same transfer 
process of any other uh, to come to any of our schools, and they'd yeah. probably have to pay tuition, I would assume, because they're outside of our funding, right? Or no? There's a lot of Kanapa City School students that live in Okay. And, that, and that's the reason I asked because, it, like you said, it's there at the research campus. It's right there mm -hmm. on the boundary of Kannapolis, and they're continually, as you know, annexing all around us up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, an opportunity like this don't come around too often. And so uh, I'm sure there is a process, and that process would have to be followed as far as I, I think what I heard say, it maybe transfers mm -hmm. and things like that. And so it would be a detailed process, mm -hmm. but it would be a nice to have it available to all students in Cabarrus County, though. All high school students in Cabarrus County to utilize this program. But they'd like to say they'd probably yeah. be a tuition or something involved. But it would be worth it though. So, okay, board members, we're ready to start. Mr. Shoemaker, you want to talk, uh, talk to us a little bit about the uh, biotech? I would. Thank you, Jason. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know my excitement, Mike, you and you guys. I'm really excited about what's going on. It's mm -hmm. over my neck of the woods. and. Uh, yeah. And I've, I've got some contacts over to research campus. Uh, one thing in, in response to your question is, I know that Canapolis City Schools is doing something with the campus, so there's probably some opportunity for some collaboration. Right. And you may want to talk with, with Pam's group, Pam Kane's folks mm -hmm. over there, and see what they're doing. And there might be some opportunity we can leverage co and collaborate right. on that program with, with yeah. those folks and, uh, and, and expand it. I'm all about collaboration and, and really working together. Um, when, when you uh, look at this program, are you including, like, it says medical. Are you looking at some contacts over at CMC Northeast as well, like the nursing program? Or will RCCC, we utilize something in their program for nursing and that type of thing? Because um, there's a, you know, yeah. the, we have a nursing college here. Sure. and. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if it would be specific to nursing, um, but I do know that the health occupations in general be, would be a, a strand of the focus of the academy. Um. Uh, and I know my daughter, when she went back 10 years ago or more, actually it was more than that, but mm -hmm. she, she participated in, and maybe it was a CTE type program where she went in and, and worked with nurses in right. the hospital and all, yep. and I guess that was... That's um, health the occupations class, or one and two basically, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so I don't know if you could leverage that and, and make it a little bit more in depth where they could start getting credits in, in that area. I mean, you're right there next to them, and it, it yeah. could be a, a, a way to also right. leverage the program. It's a very popular class, too. Um, how many students are you, do you generally think would go into this program? We would like to see um, cohorts of just under 100 um, in 11th and 12th grade really kind of powering that. Uh, most of them would come from Northwest Cabarrus, but many of them would come from from other, some of our other high schools, just like kids go to Concord's Fire Academy and just like kids go to the uh, Culinary Arts Academy at um, down at Hickory Ridge. Are you under the same type of um, timeline that you were under for uh, the STEM program at Patriots? Uh, you, obviously, I think you want to get this started this fall. Is that correct? We do, yeah. Um, and I don't know if you want to speak more to that, but we got to build the, the – the excitement, we got to build the, the knowledge base of the community. So, you know, we've already done registration. Um, kids have already signed up for courses. That's kind of already in the books. Um, so this, even as we kind of make that decision, we're going, we're going to have to promote the academy um, retroactively to some extent and, and get kids to understand that a little bit better, to understand what it is, what it's about, even the brochure that you see there. Uh, why, would I, why would I want to go into a biotech academy? All right, so right now they, you have the courses, but you really haven't marketed the, 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 the biotech academy bit, at this right. point. We haven't as marketed it, it full-fledged, um, and we haven't you know, done a robust campaign um, to, to really market it. We, we've marketed it a little bit, yeah, through the know, knowing what courses that are going to be in there and talking to kids through the guidance process. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter, you have your question. Um, so do you have any students outside from other than Northwest that have, have enrolled at this point? So you just got just Northwest. Well, I have to say I'm really excited because both of my children graduated from Northwest. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about this because we've our, this board and prior boards have tried to really give something to all the high schools. Mm -hmm. And I think we've really – really done this and Northwest now has have got their their little torch now and I, I'm really 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 excited about this I, I can't I mean I really am 
and uh, I think it's 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 really got a great niche. And one of the other areas, I, he mentioned the hospital, but I think a uh, connection with the Health Alliance, I think that would really, because, you know, with the, the health end of it, I think that would be a another avenue, because they're right up there, right, right with the uh, uh, research uh, park. I think that would be an, another resource that we can use and i think they would uh work very well with the with the schools they always have right. uh so i think that would be another one that uh, we can work with um so i'm i'm really excited i'm ready to do my vote right now too uh so I, but I, I think it will be a golden opportunity and i think it goes hand in hand with an article that was in the paper maybe two weeks ago that said the very same thing saying employers are saying Students have to have more than a high school diploma, that they are expecting more of our workforce today, and they have to have that. Right. So we are providing that and being and stepping forth to make sure that they have that. And so we've, we've got to do this. Our students have to be prepared, and so we're preparing them for it. So I say, let's go for it. Uh, and so we are going to open it up to everyone, and I think uh, yeah, it was a great thing to suggest we've got to open it up to Kannapolis. I think that's, and find out what process we have to do. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Mr. Kiger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the only thing, there, there's a glaring weakness, and there's, it's two letters, UN, UN, where you say limited amount let me find the sentence. I thought I had it. A limited choice for students to attend different academies across the attendance mm -hmm. zone. Yeah. I'd like for that to read unlimited choice for students to go. If you I don't care where you live in the county. If you want to be part of the mm -hmm. culinary arts at Hickory Ridge, you go to Hickory yeah. Ridge. If you want to be an IB, you go to Concord. You want to do the, the, the program at Northwest, you go. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think we can pay for the transportation right. piece, but, I, you know, Previous, the, the previous board to this, at, at the very first retreat mm -hmm. that I went to, we, we had that discussion. Let's give each high school something to, to put their flag up, and let's let every child, if they want to go, mm -hmm. let's let them go. And we have done an excellent job in the last couple of years of setting this up and getting on this track. And I'm thrilled to death to be able to approve this program and, and send it up to, to Northwest. Uh, reading through, I, I guess the only, I do have a question, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, these it sounds like, as I'm reading through this, that some of these programs have started, but I was not aware of uh, uh, what we're doing at, at J.M. Robinson or... Um, no, yeah, let me clarify. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we. Uh, let me tell you the ones that have started and ones that have not. So this is important for future Well, future that's plans. good because there's one that I don't like, so I want to hear okay. which one they are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, you'll find Curious out, trust that. me. <laughs> All right, so you have the Academy of Public Safety at Concord High School. That has started um, to some extent, um, and it started with the firefighters, and now we're bringing EMTs. And remember, a lot of this was started through our CTE, our Career Technical Education Program. Um, the Academy of Biotechnology and Medical Research is at is what we're talking about tonight, um, and the Academy of Inform Information Technology and Global Finance has not been started at Cox Mill. Okay, that has not been started at Cox Mill. Um, it. The reason uh, we've kind of pegged that for Cox Mill is they have a strong computer programming um, uh, course right now, strong uh, high enrollment, um, good, good numbers there, um, taking AP computer science, and kind of this Mandarin Chinese is a little feathered in the hat there. The advanced manufacturing um, and engineering at J.M. Robinson has not started. Okay, we're in infant, in fact, the, um, the company that I was talking to uh, that had the, C the engineering CEO that I was talking to, we're, we're working on a partnership uh, with that company for, for something to go maybe there. Um, the Academy of Hospitality and Tourism at Hickory Ridge has, n has not started, although it has a strong base with the culinary arts. So that's why we're thinking about using tourism hospitality there at Hickory Ridge is because of what they already have there, that culinary arts piece. Um, and the Sustainable Energy Academy at Mount Pleasant, um, we've gone back and forth with Mount Pleasant. Um, you know, 
a lot of times we peg that community being rural and agriculture. Um, and so we've tossed around things with um, organic farming, farm to table, some of the kind of hot buzzwords that you hear a lot about. Um, and, and then we kind of settled on sustainable energy because of the industry that's morphing around that and North Carolina being an energy, really an energy hub, an energy capital. Um, so that's kind of what we talked about there. And obviously then we have the STEM. So now I'm curious which one you don't like. Well, I think you're dead on on all of them except for, and it's interesting that you wrestled with it, but Mount Pleasant, I think you're, I, I, I just, that's not mm -hmm. to me, and, and again, I'm just one person, it's just yeah. one of my, my opinion, but, you know, clearly you don't want to do anything around a buzzword, and I think you mm -hmm. kind of steered yeah. away from that. I, th th to me, I, I would steer toward turf grass, turf grass management, mm -hmm. something that's very technical, there's a big field. NC State has a very good program that we've, uh, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. those are high-paying jobs. Yeah. I mean, you don't think of it now, but a golf course superintendent makes good money, yeah. and that's a good career mm -hmm. that if um, we somehow, you know, to me it kind of fits. They've got yeah. land and space to be able to do that out there. Um, so, anyway, that, the rest of them, I, you know, let's put, let's put them all on the consent agenda as far as I'm concerned, although – Carolyn, I'm surprised they didn't ask about funding, so uh, we, we, we probably do need to talk about that. Well, I, I think most of them are already done. So. Thank you, Mr. Conger. Let's, let's move along. Mr. Walter, you have your questions. Go over again if there's a student who's interested in this program. How would they, and they don't go to Northwest, how are they, how do they apply to that? Right now, that this first year, we probably wouldn't have the opportunity unless it was very late in the game. Like, we're waiting to get the approval, and then we're going to start marketing it. And if they wanted to participate this late in the game, we would work with that student. But we, you know, long term, we would go and not recruit, but we, it would be a part of the registration process that high school students go through across the county. So they would have, have an advanced awareness of the academy um, and what it's offered. Um, right now, you know, it's really going to be primarily Northwest Cabarrus st students for that first round. And if that fills up all 100, 100 no, spots? No, no, we will not have 100 spots for next year. I, I don't think that's, I don't think we'll have that. And I, I, mean, <clears throat> I think it's a great idea as well. I mean, Dr. Shepard and I were recently at a luncheon over, over, the, over the, bio, the, the academy over there, research campus, and they are looking for researchers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were, they were yeah. begging basically for students to, to come and learn how to do mm -hmm. the research, and that's, that's huge. And I think partnering with them would be, yeah. there's so many opportunities yeah. there. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Mr. Harrison. And I'm sorry to be the uh, perpetual proofreader uh, here, but on the Northwest Cabarrus High School Biotech and Life Sciences brochure, mm -hmm. Academy is chopped off there a little bit. Nudge or bump that up so that it prints out completely and oh, you'll see the see entire that. word Academy. And uh, uh, the biggest epiphany I ever had as a young person was the Occupational Quarterly Outlook, which is a U.S. Department of Labor book of statistics that gives mm -hmm. a uh, projection of the number of jobs in a certain field that will be needed in a geographic mm -hmm. location for two and three and five years out mm -hmm. into the future. And this whole brochure has got yeah. 20 different examples. And you could go to the Occupational Quarterly Outlook and you've got enough white space in your brochure here okay. to say in five years from now, the Southeast is going to need X number of, mm -hmm. of these exact, literally, these exact yeah. job titles. That would make it real to some student yeah. who at the age of or grade of 11th or 12th grade would say, five years from now, I would like to be that, right. that job. Yeah. Um, give them real numbers that they could cross-reference. Good. And then they would, suggest. and yep. you, you can lead a person to, to mm -hmm. water, so to speak, right. but there, there would be the information that sure. would be useful to them um, and verifiable and, and factual. Right, very good. Please consider that. Absolutely. I think it would strengthen the yep. brochure a great deal. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Phillips. Well, I, I also think this is a great idea. In, in my spare time, I serve on the advisory council of the, for the engineering school at Washington University in St. Louis, which you may not have heard of, but it turns out it's a very good engineering school. And uh, I was shocked to find out that now half of the students at the engineering school there go into biomedical engineering. Mm -hmm. It is a huge field. 
And uh, so I, I think this is a great program because it, it it's going to uh, be helpful to students, whether whether your, your goal is to get uh, an associate's degree and then go to work at the uh, um, research center there in Kannapolis as a, a lab technician, or whether you want to go on to be a... Uh, a biomedical engineer who designs um, artificial limbs for for soldiers who have had their arms blown off. Um, mm -hmm. This is where you go, mm -hmm. and and uh, I I really applaud you for for doing that. Mm -hmm. And then if we're going to come up with suggestions of of other potential programs coming from the power industry, I can tell you that there is a vast shortage in this country of qualified welders. Mm. Such that if you are a qualified That's welder, true. you can make a hundred thousand dollars a year. And and in this area, there is so much work going on um, related to the po uh, power industry that I think it would behoove us to have a um, uh, some kind of a program that would help address that need. When you say power industry, how, that's not the same as energy. No. You're well, saying, it's it, it's it's okay. electric power. Electric so power. so okay. it, it's I guess part of the. It's a subset of the energy field, and certainly the demand for welders also okay. exists in the energy field. It's just okay. there aren't any oil refineries okay. within 300 miles of Charlotte. So. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. You know, it's exciting times in Cabarrus County Schools. Don't you think it is? I mean, really, it's very exciting times because opportunities like this don't come along too often. And it's just great to get it in place. Are there any other comments? Mr. Shoemaker, you have any other I comments? I have one more. Okay. Um, just to piggyback off of uh, what Blake had talked about with, the, with Mount Pleasant, mm -hmm. I think a sustainable type agricultural course that deals with animal science and agronomy and you know sustainable farming, because that whole community, when you look at how we've zoned that area, it's going to stay kind of where it is. The, 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 the large eastern area plan really calls for the Mount Pleasant area to stay rural. And, and there's not going to be an expansion of, uh, of um, sewer and water out into that area to, you know, really make it much of a, um, you know, a development area. So the children out there will be associated with that. And you've got some really good farmers. And you've got the Rymer, um, uh, the, kill farm, the kill floor out there that, does um, meat packing and all of that type of stuff. So there's a lot of opportunities that you could piggyback off of what's going on in the area and, and do something yeah. along sustainable agriculture where people could use, learn how to use their farms and start right. in, in high school how to, how to really make a farm a productive thing and a year-round right. type of activity rather than just something... Yeah, and you'll notice in our original kind of proposal we had a, there was a third prong to that was entrepreneurship. And so this kind of understanding that part of that sustainable, organic, whatever, um, has you have to have the business entrepreneurial skills to, to manage your own business, basically. So that was a part of our early thinking. But again, I appreciate all the ideas in particular around uh, Mount Pleasant. Um, you know, we, we uh, are talking at length with Edie and her staff there about what, what we can put there that is a um, good, good fit for the community, uh, but a good draw for kids as well. So thank you. Ms. Carpenter, go ahead. One other thing. With uh, the biotech, uh, and I don't know if you've looked into this, the the biotech bus or the bus that goes around that was recently at the PLC, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it usually goes to colleges. It usually will go to community colleges. But this is something that, that you may want to check in to possibly getting. It was at the PLC. But it, it, it you can go on it, and they can actually explore different. They have different stations set up. And then the young people can actually, they've got cards, and it shows the professions that they can go into how much they right. pay, where they can go to college, to other colleges yeah. to get this extended education. It's great. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, tool. But this is maybe something that you want to check into. And But they had it over at the PLC, so you can check with them. But it usually goes to colleges. Uh, and But it just happened to be over there. But that may be something you want to check into once you all get started. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Okay, board, everybody okay? Oh, Mr. Walter? I'll throw my suggestion out there as well. Um, Cabarrus County, Hub of NASCAR, Hub of Racing, um, maybe J.M. Robinson Academy, the engineering, manufacturing, and motorsports. And there's a partnership with UNCC that they've got the motorsports 
things going on as well. Um, again, a lot of our, our families are involved in that industry. And it's again, brings millions of dollars into our local communities. Thank you, Mr. Walter. So I think everybody's pretty much okay with the consent agenda for the Biotech Academy. It, is everybody okay? Okay, yeah. All right, Jason, you're good to go for the consent agenda. All right, our next item, 5.4, .4, Child Nutrition Program, and uh, we got Dr. Kelly Probst and Mr. Frank Fiorella here, and so uh, you guys have the podium. Thank you for being here. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Shu said earlier this evening he liked short presentations, so I'm going to skip to the last slide of the presentation. I'd like to introduce to you Frank Fiorella, our child nutrition uh, director. I don't think that you all have had the opportunity to meet him, but Frank has been a wonderful addition to our program this past year. Um, in terms of meal prices, we came to you last spring with the addition of the um, Hunger Free uh, Child Act, and we had to uh, serve more fresh vegetables and fruits and whole grains to our students. Pricing, of course, for these commodities had gone up, so we needed to raise um, our lunch prices by 10 cents. At the time, uh, we were toying with raising 15 or 20 percent, but the board decided because of the recession, let's go to, for the least amount, knowing it was a minimal increase and we'd have to come back this year. We have now worked with the federal government in terms of what they're predicting for pricing for next year. And again, we are requesting a 10 cent increase for child nutrition. If you look at the slide that I have before you, this is the slide that shows you what all our neighboring counties are going to be charging next year. I will tell you that we found out today, Rowan County is going to raise their prices by 15 cents. Um, and one of the variables that you'll see in this chart is the free and reduced rate. When a district has a higher free and reduced rate, the federal government gives back more money to that district. So when you see, I'll, I'll point out Kannapolis to you. We are side by side by Kannapolis, but they, are, um, they have many more free and reduced children. They get a higher return back from the government, and therefore they do not need to charge as much for the meals. So in other words, um, the poorer the county, the lower the meal price. And so that's why you'll see that variance. We do have options um, if we don't raise by 10 cents. The first one is the federal government allows the LEA to pay that difference into the child nutrition program. And we estimate that amount to be $140,000. It cannot come from any other federal funding source. It would probably have to come out of local monies. We did not put that in our budget request for this year. The other option would be to do nothing. And at that point, the federal government could come in and say, you have not lived up to your end of the bargain. We gave you the formula. You were to raise your prices and or pay $140,000. Therefore, we could withhold $6 million. Definitely don't want that option. So at this point, I think it's fair to say this is not um, a discussion on whether or not we agree with the federal government. This is the mandate that we will provide more fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains to our students. And it's going to cost us more next year. So Frank is here to answer any of your questions regarding the program, um, but it is our uh, request to raise prices by 10 cents. Thank you, Dr. Probst. As, as you well stated, you know, this is a situation where we don't really have much choice. I mean, we either do it or we lose funding. And so it's not really a lot of choice, uh, but uh, I want to give the board opportunity to ask questions and uh, that they may have or may not. But uh, Mr. Phillips, we'll start on your side, and you can, you can come down. Mr. Phillips, you okay? Mr. Harrison? Just very quickly, do we have any way of quantifying waste, loss? How much, how many gallons of milk do we throw out a day um, for children not consuming the, the, the product? Why don't you tell them about our research sure. study? <laughs> we um, did a study with interns this year with our fruits and vegetables. Then they sat at garbage cans to track waste. Um, 
for the most part, students will take vet fruits and eat their fruits, vegetables, not so much. A lot of that goes away. Um, students do have the option to choose three items out of the five that we offer them. So they don't have to take everything. They don't have to take milk. Um, they could take an entree that is, consists of a grain serving as well, and then a fruit or vegetable. Um, but yes, there's waste, and there's lots of reasons for waste. Um, kids don't like it. Kids are out there, and they talk to their friends. And by the time they know it, the bell rings, and they have to get to class, and half of their lunch is gone in the garbage. Um, it's a problem, um, but with the regulations, USDA regulations, we do have to offer, we do have to ensure that each child, each student has three out of five components on their tray to claim that meal and get the federal reimbursement. I want to add that I do think that um, Frank and his department are doing a good job going out into the schools and looking at meal patterns and looking at the eating patterns of the students and just as, as something I never thought about. When you put a whole orange or a whole apple on a middle school student's tray, they won't eat it. But if you cut it into slices, they will. And the variable, the braces. Never, you know, so little things like that, his department is making sure that the students will take these items and eat them. And, and I'm absolutely convinced that the, the waste is not uh, administrative. It is in terms of a child's taste or preparing the, the food that way to make it more palpable to them. And just for the record, I do like broccoli. Um, but, uh, but gracious, there seems to be a disinclination among young people to eat food that's good for them, yet it is money that we have to spend uh, per all these regulations, yet is, is some portion of it is just thrown out. And it's a sad reality, I know, but... Um, I just wish we would have, have some way to quantify and manage um, the whole picture um, and manage the portion that is not consumed as it should be. I'm just ge speaking generally about that. Thank you, Mr. Thank Harrison. you for all you do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Walter, you have questions? Yeah, Mr. Harrison makes a good point that uh, you were forcing folks to take 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 the students to take this food if they're going to eat it or not. So, and I don't. What exactly are we changing again for our meal that we we pro, we provide today that we we now have to provide next next year? Is is that what we're doing? We've got to, we've got to add additional foods. Are we adding additional foods for next school year? Yes. Um, Increasing. Not particularly, no, and not for. Not well, there was for, some comment here about having to move to all grains, or that, that's for the following. School okay, that's year. The following year after that. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. But this, um, you want to talk? The sure. state recommends that we move more aggressively than what they're doing, so that you're not caught behind. Mm -hmm. And so we're already offering um, whole grains and fruits and things like that. So you have to keep moving. Um, we're not advancing too fast, but we are also, the state looks at us and goes, you're doing a good job of being on that curve. Our breakfast program um, next year will introduce, or where most of our schools are doing now, but will be mandated to offer a fruit serving at breakfast along with the fruit juice that's offered. Um, the reason that The 10 cents is being recommended is because of the uh, paid lunch equity. And that paid lunch equity is something that the US, USDA mandated. And it's to get the paid lunch meal price equal to or in increments over the next X amount of years to what the federal reimbursement is for a free and reduced price meal. Um, right now, our reimbursement rate is um, over $2.80 for a free meal. And obviously that $2.59 came from the average and 
that's where they're recommending us get to to have equity in the meal price. Our cost per meal is close to three dollars total cost. That oh. includes um, that includes labor and overhead and all of that. Um, so a plate cost is three dollars. We don't get that. We don't receive that in a meal reimbursement from federal government order paid meal for the most part. Right. I don't like the fact that the, the federal government is dictating uh, for us to raise the price. I don't like the fact that the federal government is telling us what, what our children should be eating. Um, and it affects, you know, again, <clears throat> it's not everybody that's paying this. It's the 17,000 folks that, that are actually, the f students that are actually paying the full price. Mm -hmm. um, and that adds, that adds up because we're required to, to move it 10 cents this year. We're supposed to move it again until it gets up to whatever this level was. And, uh, just based on my calculations, I mean, that's $18 a year um, for this next year. Correct. The employment rate's still pretty, the unemployment rate's still pretty the same. People are still struggling. And if you add it all up, that's gonna be another $72, $72 a year for families per student. I mean, I have two students in the school system. I mean, that, that does add up for, for for us. So, uh, you know, it, it just troubles me that we were mandated by the government to do these rates or, or they, they cut that off. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Walter. And you're right on, you know, you're right on. I mean, the comments from the board thus, thus far are right on. It's a shame. You know, I remember when I went in the Army back in 1972, a little old country boy from down on Flowstore Road, and I couldn't, I just could not believe the waste go through the chow line in the mess hall there. And at the end of the day, they just throwed boxes and boxes and boxes of steaks away when I had never even had a steak before. And they just throwed them away in the garbage can. And, uh, and milk just throwed the big five-gallon containers. And uh, it's, it's the government, you know. And, uh, but you got to do it. You, you got to do it or you don't get your funding. So, but anyway, that's my comments. No, Mr. I'll, Mr. Just, I'll just throw the, this in. My, pardon me. My mama was a depression baby, and she detested waste. And I'm sorry, maybe that's where I get it from. Uh, just absolutely hated waste. It was a sin. Sorry. I'll get off my soapbox. Okay, Miss Carpenter. Well, and, and I don't like waste either. And, and what gets me, somebody, and I've been in the schools and been in the cafeteria, and I remember the good old smells you used to smell when you went into the cafeteria. You don't smell those smells anymore because we don't cook anything anymore. We microwave the stuff. And maybe if we cook the stuff, maybe the kids would eat the stuff. Now, I'm just telling it like it is. Um, and one of the things, why can't we do like Union does? If we look across, we should be competitive like Union. Why can they do elementary breakfast for $2? And we're already up to 220, and and their free percentage is 29.61, and we're 36.42. Now look at their numbers. I mean, why are we? I mean, really, we're we're really pretty much just like them. Why are they less than what we are? Before the paid lunch equity came into place it wasn't it was up to that county's discretion on what price they had to set for that how they set for each meal each school district that's listed on here will have to keep on increasing their price until they reach that magic number whatever usda sets it and it seems to be a moving number year after year so we may catch up to that number faster than Union County, but they will have to get to that number as well at this point. But I mean, I mean, we're we're still higher, but they're they're. I mean, how can they do it for two dollars and we can't do it for two dollars? It's basically. And I mean, I'm I'm really upset of this. I, I'm I'm with Rob. I mean, here, what if a parent's got four or five kids? And we're still during some pretty tough times. We've been talking about jobs, all this. Well, what do we do with the kids that really can't afford it? Because there's some parents that's pretty proud, and they don't want to have to go ask for those free and reduced lunches. They won't ask for it. And what if they don't have that money to do it? That's what I worry about, and that's why I voted no. And I know, Lynn, you're saying, we got to do it. But there's some proud people out there that don't want to do it. And they're the, and those kids, they don't, they may go and not eat. 
And that's what I worry about. And I don't like it when the government tells me I've got to do something. And, and if all of us sit here and say, yeah, we're going to vote for it, we're letting them tell us to do that. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Good comments. Mr. Shoemaker. I'm sorry. How do I follow that one? <laughs> I'm sorry, no. I really put you in No, no, no. Um, I, actually, I brought this up to our, um, to our representative, Mr. Hudson, at, when he was last in town, and I asked him about this. And I also asked him about the child, nutri not the child nutrition, but the Head Start program, the fact that there's two different standards for providing children meals, and they're different. And we're held accountable for two different standards, and I said, this is wrong. We should only have one standard, and we should be able to feed a child the same meal regardless of what program they're in. And um, then I asked him, since he's on the Agricultural Committee, that uh, perhaps there is some, uh, I guess we use Cisco or U.S. Foods, one of the two, to provide our foods. Do you know where our, agri you know, where our green vegetables and all come from? Are they shipped in from anywhere around Mexico, or are they U.S. grown, or...? Everything that we purchase has to be, uh, we're under Buy American with our North Carolina Procurement Alliance bid. Um, also, um, that encompasses our produce company. And some of the produce that we do get, um, most of the seasonal vegetable in North Carolina is purchased. That's what we get. North so you Carolina. get a lot of seasonal North Carolina grown Produce. Yes, sir. That's a good thing. I was a, I was a concern as whether we were helping our own state's farmers out with uh, with the purchases that we made. Um, yes, if we didn't raise the price, you're saying we would lose 140 thousand a year. Is that how much we would have to augment? Because obviously we've got to pay a. If we don't raise the price, somebody's got to pay for that. That's correct. Can you help us with that? That that's a, um, estimated number based on. The amount of meals that we served in October of 2012, that number is a capture for the month. I multiplied that number by nine and a half months, approximate number of days that we would serve, um, and that's where I came up with the $140,000, but it's an estimated number. It just depends on the amount of meals that we would serve in 2013, 2014. All right, so that would be what our district would have to go into the reserves to take up if we decided not to to raise the prices to our to our families is that correct that's correct but you need to realize it's a reoccurring expense right it's every and then year. the following year could be that they are going to say 280,000 because they they want you to move up to that target amount um, and not just stay level funding where you are now so it's a, a reoccurring expense, but if they said, well, you know, this year you were supposed to add 10 cents, next year you're supposed to add another 10, 10 cents, so that would be 20 cents. Well, we added 10 cents last year. Well, they want that right. continued until you get... Was it 5 cents? I thought it was 10 cents last year. It was 5 cents. 5 cents? Five. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, so. I said 10. Sorry. Well, I, I'm so sorry. So I said 10. It was $9 a five. child last year, $18 a child this coming year and 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 so forth and so on the two dollars and 59 cent which is where we're trying to work to the target is that right 259 that is this current year's target okay so we're going to raise it 10 cent be 269 no we will be at the 259 we were okay right. so we after this particular increase we'll be where we're supposed to be we'll be right in line with this current year. all right now this this target rate that we're looking at is that a regional or a national target rate it's a national target and say you know and, then, and see that's really unfair too in my opinion because different areas you know it's not the same in north carolina as it is in new york or california or somewhere out west you know, where the, an apartment in New York's three thousand dollars for a one room bedroom apartment, down here you can get one for seven or eight hundred. California is the same way. North Carolina is different. And uh, but I, I share the sentiments of the board. You know, the concerns, the waste, the, the government, and all. But I, a pastor told me one time, long time ago. He said, Lynn, he said, if the federal government puts a dollar in it, they're going to control it. And that's exactly what we're talking about right here. But anyway. 
you know, our hands are tied. So, board members, where are you at? Consent agenda? Well, uh, since, I, agenda? since I passed my opportunity to jump on the uh, bandwagon of bashing the federal government, I, and I'm just, I, no, I, 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 you know, it is. It's, it, we're in a tough spot. I, you know, Carolyn, I understand your sentiment that we're just taking it, but I don't think we can put in jeopardy $6 million to our, our, our system. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's great to make a statement, make a stand, and I, I, I'm, I'm with you on, on griping about it and, and then the waste. And, and, Rob, you're right. There's only half the people paying for it. The other half aren't paying for it. Or 50, well, you had a 57% or something. I guess we had it in front of us. Yeah, 17. But anyway, I, 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 whether it's consent or action, I, I don't know. But it, it, we just can't put $6 million in jeopardy for our system. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. How much are we augmenting the program right now? Because you said, to, you said right now that we're paying $3.10 a meal, right? If, if, if we're only charging $2.30, then 17,000 people are... 50 or 60 cents short of the uh, of the mark so our district is already augmenting the program is that true the money gets made up in caterings and um, supplemental sales extra uh, additional items that students buy so y'all have some type of revenue producer like Additional. Okay, so that's yes. how yes. you're that's how you're making up the shortfall. Yes, sir. So you'd have to do more a la carte menus to make this, and, and uh, no, the goal the goal is not to do a la carte menus. The goal is to have a well balanced meal that that <laughs> is enjoyable for as many students as possible. Um, but those a la carte items do help support. The goal the is to bring in revenue. That's the goal. <laughs> Well, the red, yes, sir. <laughs> well, I can't see how all these other school systems are going from anywhere from a dollar eighty-five to two fifty, and they're not being charged six million dollars. No, no, they would fall into the same. If, excuse me, if they don't um, make the recommended changes of what they were told, their district should raise their prices. And if they, the LEA doesn't come up with whatever funding that equals to, like ours is 140000 they would possibly lose their money too. But they're all proposing $0.10, cent and that's not going to get them anywhere near where they need to be. I mean, no, we're near. That's one down in Cleveland, $1.75, $1.85. That's a long ways from two fifty nine. Well, Let whatever. me give you an analogy. Do you remember when we started testing and one state might say, well, we only need 60% of our kids to pass. And another state said, well, you have to have 80%. And every state was doing something different. But they all said by 2014, you have to be at 100%. This is the same thing that's happening. Wherever the district started is where they're letting them come in. So that district that you see down there in Cleveland County, they're going to have to keep adding that money, even though we might get to stop. And then again, you know, the county government could be uh, subsidizing, like in this case, the 140,000. I mean, we wouldn't, we have not, and I don't think we would want to, because it should be a self-funded program. But we could ask the county to fund the 140,000, leave the price like it is. But guess what? We're going to still have to do something next year, and then the year after. So you just have to just, like Barney says, nib it in the bud, move on. So with that being said, where are we at, board? We action one more, consent. One more, one more. Oh, okay, Mr. Walker. On the a la carte prices, you're raising those as well, is from the sheet that you sent to me, the hamburger, the what is it called, the quick bite lunch combos? That's a, um, a, a meal that is a higher price um, because the cost of food is a little higher. It's um, the hamburger is a all natural hamburger. The chicken is whole muscle chicken. Um, all students have the ability to take that meal but we do charge a higher price for it okay and then the last question just for the, the parents at home the budget for next year so if someone was to get what an elementary school student to have breakfast and lunch that's like six hundred dollars six hundred twenty four dollars on my calculation I could be could be wrong um, for meals for per student and uh, middle school I had six hundred and sixty nine and high school I had eight hundred and fives that's all I had. 
Thank you, Mr. Walter. Good information that you shared with us. Thank you. All right, where are we at, board? Consent, action. 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 Okay, that's what we'll do. We'll put it on the action agenda for the 15th. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we need to move along. 5.5, we have uh, Ms. Donna Smith going to come to the podium, and she's there. We're going to talk about the Memorandum of Understanding between Cabarrus County Schools and North Carolina Department of Public Safety, Division of Adult Corrections. Donna. It's truly a long title, but I think the concept is very simple, and I can somewhat put your mind at ease that what I'm getting ready to talk about has nothing to do with finances at all. There is no money that will be talked about. And uh, that's, that's kind of a novel idea right now. <laughs> um, I want to personally thank right now Catherine Combs, who is the Judicial District Manager from uh, District 19A, for contacting us. We as a district have done really well in making our policies and things change to fit the School Violence Prevention Act, but there was a piece in there that we did not see, and she brought it to our attention, and I'd just like to read that to you, that in 2012, as the School Violence Prevention Act wrote, it began to prohibit probation officers from visiting students during school hours on school property, but said an exception is made for probation officers who are working as part of the Division of Community Corrections School Partnership Program with prior authorization by school administrators. Bottom line, what that means is we view our probation officers as a support system. And not that we take, um, do a lot of asking that they come, but there are some students who are under adult probation. And when the Violence Prevention Act came into being here, it said unless we have a partnership agreement, which is simply an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, that explains that we work cooperatively together, we cannot invite them to come onto our campuses during school days. It's another one of the laws that began to change access. As she talked about it, she said they as probation officers did not have a good grasp in terms of why that was included but that they had been asked to make sure the school districts knew they could no longer provide services unless we developed a memorandum of understanding. And what you have attached here is actually the memorandum of understanding that's somewhat of a template that's being used throughout the state. And as I was looking at it, I think the best description is at the end of page one here where it says, the Cabarrus County Public Schools and the 19A Judicial District of Community Corrections agree to engage in a collaborative effort to foster a safe school environment and to develop solutions to problems through communication, behavioral objectives, and realistic goal setting for students enrolled in school while under probation supervision. So our request tonight, as you turn the page, there is one typo that we would want to make sure we delete, and that is as that paragraph continues, the sentence should actually end uh, with the support of the superintendent of schools, hereby agree. This is also an agreement that's used by community college systems to actually let probation officers uh, be present there too. But it's simply saying we can request that they come to campus, they can talk with our students, and it's only students that are under their probational services at this time. And so our request tonight is actually that this be considered by the board, that if we do not enter into a partnership, which will be a memorandum of agreement, we cannot have their support on campus. So everything would have to be outside of campus and our administrators would have to make that contact that way. And so in checking with our administrators, this is viewed when this is necessary as a very important partnership. Thank you for bringing that to us, Ms. Smith. Uh, board members, you have it here before you. You've had time to review it. Mr. Schumacher, you got your comments or questions on this memorandum of understanding? No. Ms. Carpenter. Just one question. Now, does I mean, I know this is the probation officers, but do we not have to have anything else since the children sometimes may be underage? No, these are the adults. Uh, Mark may want to speak to that. Yeah, I don't. Um, these, the ones that have probation officers have generally been tried as an adult, so they're already dealing directly with the probation officers. We did talk some about parental consent. We do have a separate board policy on law enforcement officers are coming to do interviews, but it's my understanding here with these probation officers, in order to be placed on probation, you're going to be tried as an adult, you're going to be dealing directly with the juvenile 
uh, for those crimes. Okay, so we don't have to have anything with that. So I think okay, we're, that, I think that's we're okay my only that. concern. I yep. just want to make sure we don't have to. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Kiger. Okay, Mr. Walter, you have questions? Are most of these students at the alternative schools? Not necessarily. Mr. Harrison. That was my question, and I find that disturbing. I find that deeply and profoundly disturbing. Okay. I don't know what else to say. That if there are students who have had those encounters with the law and have been tried and convicted and whatever their situation is, uh, maybe there are a few examples that I don't understand, but if, if there's anything violent in the um, uh, charges against them, um, I, I would like to think that they're not at regular schools. I think that that part you can take great comfort. I, I'm sure. I want to say that, but I just don't know what scenarios it may be under. But Because um, there is a process in place that our district works very closely with the courts in the sense of when a student is violent, there are actions taken. So as far as someone being under probation and being a very violent student, I don't think you'll find those in our schools. So then what, generally very quickly if you can, There's what kinds of charges um, might this apply to? There's that? a range of probational reason yeah, I, mean, I, do, I do think it's a range it could be a drug offense it could be a theft I mean there, there's a variety of things that they could be tried as an adult and still be and it may be some of them may have served a short jail sentence and then be placed on probation some would be placed on probation in lieu of jail um, so yeah if if the court the court could remand them to a juvenile detention facility um, for the serious or violent offenses so these would be ones that the court felt should be placed back in the schools and in society so that's, that would really be the juvenile, the sentencing court would decide whether to place them on probation, in which case they would be back in society. Legally, if they're on probation, though, and not in a detention facility, we're obligated to educate them. But we, we, don't, we wouldn't have an option of excluding them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Phillips. Well, it sounds like you've already, Mr. Enriquez, you've already reviewed this, but that was just my one question was, have you reviewed this do you have any concerns about this putting the school district in a um, position where we could be liable for something that the the perpetrator or the uh, probation the person on probation could sue the district because we violated their rights somehow I, I have reviewed it and I, I'm comfortable with it. I think the one thing I talked to Donna and, and we talked some with the other school staff about is the statute was addressed to some systems were concerned that probation officers were spending too much time in the school and it was disruptive. So I think what we were talking about is for Cabarrus, is our relationship one where we want to continue it and have them come into the schools or do we want to use this statute to say no you, you shouldn't come to the schools talk to the students elsewhere but I think staff uh, we talked to the principal I asked Donna and Chris to talk to principals but the feedback was we think they're supportive they help us monitor the students and we want to continue having them in the school so really this MOU will essentially allow us to operate the way we've been operating and, and my question was is this something the schools want or don't want we could say no but I think the answer back was we're happy we think it's a good relationship and really this MOU doesn't really change it it just allows us to continue uh, the same relationship we've had but we're complying with the new statute which says you got to have a policy and a procedure in place if they're going to still come to the schools so it's a it's a way to really preserve the status quo which is my understanding what the what the administrators wanted That's great. Thank you, board members. Uh, it's an unfortunate situation that we have to deal with children that sort of get in trouble and have to have probation officers and all that. But it's a good thing, though, that we do what we can to keep them in school because every child deserves an education. Every child deserves to walk the floor out at the event center in June. And so this is just another way that we try to do that. So, board members, are we okay for the consent agenda on the MOU? Everybody okay for that? Okay. We have it for the consent agenda. Thank, Thank you, you, Donna. All right. Board members are going to move to 5.6. Uh, Mr. Wickey has stepped out of the room. He'll be here shortly. 
Uh, just wanted to comment. I think that what we're probably going to have to do, and I haven't talked to Dr. Shepard or anyone about this, but I think what we're going to probably have to do on 5.6 is just table this, but we'll see what Mr. Whitkey has to say when he gets here because we don't have much information at all. And uh, but Mr. Wickey, you can address your concerns about this, and then we can move forward whichever way you uh, think we need to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did verify that we do have a meeting uh, with the NCDOT folks this Thursday. So uh, my purpose this evening was really just to go over what is now being proposed. Uh, originally, when this was discussed, I want to say probably almost two years ago, the route that was discussed was, if you can see my arrow here, uh, we were going to come down this way with a road. No. Okay. Well, I, where, can you see at least the green line, the light green line? Okay. Well, that, that's completely different from the way we originally talked about. And, and this was done before I was in the, my current position. But as I recall the conversation, where it where that green line pops up and then comes around the outfield outfield of the ball fields uh, it was going to actually turn down and go through the school parking lot areas and then they, the railroad was actually going to construct another paved lane for us and that was a benefit to us because it was going to allow our bus traffic and car traffic to be separated as they departed the uh, parking lots so now We've ended up with this proposal, and I'm not sure how we got here, but uh, we will be meeting Thursday to talk about it. There are many concerns that we have. Uh, it's a road that um, looks to be at least partially on our land, partially on private land. Um, I'm not sure. At this time, I was told it's going to be a gravel road, not a paved road. Uh, there are certainly concerns about washouts and all that over time. I'm concerned about the maintenance of it. Um, it does allow traffic going back and forth so I think there's an issue about liability and has struck balls and cars coming across the road and getting their windshields broken uh, now, now granted there's not a lot of those diamonds that would put a ball in play there but there are a couple and I I just I want to hear what Harrisburg uh, Parks has to say about it because they're involved in this in the use of these fields quite a bit uh, I'm certainly uh, ultimately I want to know what our attorneys have to, to say about it I was of the thinking that we had paperwork in place when Joe Size was involved and in communicating with these folks. As it turns out, nothing was really put in, in writing. So it's sort of we're starting out from scratch. And I thought when I presented this or, or put it in, on the agenda that it was much further along. And now I'm finding out we really don't have a lot of information about it. So I just wanted you to see the document, see what we'll be talking about on Thursday. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take it up again on Monday if I have more information for you at that time. Otherwise, I might just ask for a postponement until I, I get further details. Thank you, Mr. Wickey. It would be my recommendation that we just table this item. Mr. Wickey, would you not agree? I, I Mr. do, sir. Chairman, yeah, and Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we, we table this. At, to, to okay, I have, to have a motion that we table the, uh, this item, and do I have a second? Second. Mr. Walter seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, motion carries 7 0. Okay, Mr. Wickey, if you get some information for us that would be one way or the other, you know, if you did get it, you know, and obviously we'd like to see it, but yes. if not, it'd probably be May, maybe. Yes, I understand. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Wickey. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, let's see. We need to move right along now to. Uh, Five point seven, and this one be will also be Mr. Whitkey. I believe you're going to also talk about uh, the Jay Robinson Stadium out there. I mean, Fieldhouse. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, some of the uh, credit for for shining a, a new light on this uh, really, I should say, all the credit goes to uh, uh, Eileen uh, because uh, she she was the researcher and she she remembered. Uh, more of the discussions than I did. Uh, again, this, this predated me a bit, but um, it turns out that um, the, the board actually does have or did have a contract in existence with Paul Lorenz for the design of this field house as early as October of 2009. And he developed a plan um, for a 4,000 square foot building based on his communications with the Booster Club and the 
and the uh, staff of the school, and the board accepted that plan and agreed uh, that they signed the contract and, and asked them to continue on. And I think what happened, I, I really haven't had an opportunity, having just recently received this information, I didn't get to talk to Paul about why, why it got stopped, but at some point, the project did stop, and, and I suspect it was because of the funding and, and the fact that, that there wasn't enough money and the fact that our board at that time didn't have access to additional funds to pay for it. So it, it did uh, come to a stop at some point. And so I, I guess in terms of the idea of uh, you know, basically establishing that relationship with Paul again, it's not creating a new relationship, it's simply reestablishing one that we had already with his firm on the same project. And the difference would be that the scope of work is now only to do a, a design and, a, and establish a cost estimate because uh, we really don't want to go much further than design development at this point until we know what the cost of the building is. And the boosters have really said the same thing. They're anxious to find out how much it costs. They're willing to try and develop additional uh, funding for the project if necessary. Uh, but it's all sort of hinging on what needs to be built based on Title IX and, and the needs of the school, and also in keeping with other schools, you know, facilities that we have currently. I, did, I, I sent something out early uh, this evening. I don't know if everybody saw it, but in effect, the uh, four uh, schools that have field houses now range in area between about 5,300 and 60 some hundred, 6,200 square feet, I think, per building. The one that we currently had designed by Paul was at 4,000 square feet, as I mentioned, but that didn't particularly address Title IX. And the key is going to be, uh, as we were talking uh, prior to the meeting this evening, the key is really going to be defining uh, the inner interfacings or inner or conflicts of scheduling between boys and girls athletics, and uh, for for each you know school, depending on the athletics programs they have. Some some of those may not be of conflict, and it may have uh, only boys on the field, but, and it, it, and it wouldn't have a great, it wouldn't change the design of the building. But I suspect in this case, from what I've heard so far from the staff, is that there will be some conflicts of boys and girls athletics occurring at the same time, and that's that's where Title IX plays a role. So. Uh, uh, we're anxious to get the architects involved and, and moving. Uh, I've asked, uh, and, and I would like to ask for uh, approval of the board this evening, if possible, to allow us to uh, recreate a, a relationship with this architect and let him proceed on the design as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Wickey. I agree with you. We've got to move forward. I'd like to give the board opportunity to ask questions if they have any. But, uh, you know, the money's laid out. The commissioners have done shown their support. The boosters have raised money. They've paid what's been paid already. They did that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I see that we've got to pretty much continue right on what they're, what they're wanting to do. So with that being said, Mr. Shoemaker, you have any questions about uh, reinstating Mr. Lorenz as the architect for uh, the J. Robinson Fieldhouse project? As far as reinstating Mr. Lorenz, I have no problem with going in that direction. Um, I, but I do have concerns about the size of the what we had seen on a, a, straw, a straw man being over 8,000 square feet. And you know, we really do need to get a handle on this, this cost, so hopefully he can uh, get this going. Um, I did go and look at the, um, the new facility that was built over at Rocky River which was a, um, a bathroom facility. Can I just interrupt you, Mr. Shermaine, yes, for a minute? Chris, Chris, excuse me. Would you, would you mind opening the door for Spectrum? There, <laughs> yes, the, we asked Spectrum to come in and adjust the alarm system on the building. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a good thing. We don't all, all want to be closed in here for the evenings. <laughs> anyway, let's look at, I've dragged you guys at, here past 11 o'clock. But anyway. Yes, um, but that that's a nice building, and um, I like the precast on it, and it may be a way that we can save some money. Uh, Blake and I have already talked about it, and uh, so yeah. it's something that hopefully he can look into. Any, anything we can do to save some money on this building will be a, a boon for us. And in the case of, of that building, as I, as I think I mentioned to uh, Mr. Kiger, the, the construction time was just crushed by by that process it was uh, building walls of that size masonry would have taken a couple months probably and that they put the precast up in four four hours they yeah. had all the walls in place 
And it's amazing. I mean, with the precast, you know, you, you, you get a nice manufacturing environment and you put this thing together so you don't have the labor associated with piecework and, and everything else. All of it's done in a nice uh, a, 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 an environment set up to do precast. And, and you, so you get a, even though you pay more for the materials, in the end, you're really saving a lot of money when it comes to erection and all. So, Thank you, Thank Mr. Shoemaker. Ms. Carpenter. Well, I used to price out precast panels and used to work for a precast uh, company, so oh. <laughs> I can help you with that. Yes, I, I did you that for years. Yes, I was a precaster, uh, so I used to do that. Uh, so I can tell you all about precast panels. Uh, so if you ever need that, let me know. Uh, so, uh, but I have no problem with, um, you know, uh, working uh, with uh, that architect and, and going on because he did start the process. Yep. And so I, we need to move on. And, and do that. Uh, so um, I think that's in, in looking at that project, that's fine. And again, I'm familiar with precast and, and worked in that industry for almost 10 years. So oh, I'm, I'm familiar with that. So yeah, I know all project. about that. Uh, so uh, uh, let's move on. And, and, and I know we're all waiting for seeing where we are with that. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm, I'm ready to move. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Carpenter. Mr. Kiger, you have your comment. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, yeah, it, certainly by all, by all means proceed with Mr. Lawrence. I think that's the way to go. We've got a lot more discussion of the nuts and bolts, but that's not tonight. So, yes, proceed. Thank you, thank you Mr. Kiger. Mr. Walter. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, construction Committee has reviewed this and is dealing with it. Yeah, I'm going to refer, defer to the Construction Committee. That's fine with me. Mr. Harrison. Ditto, and I hope... Um, other boards in the future will honor our commitments um, as circumstances arise that we can't fulfill those commitments while we are on the board. And uh, I think it's an honorable thing for us to continue um, the commitments that previous boards have made in this case, or any case like it for that matter, which is a lesson to us about making commitments and being able to fulfill those commitments in a short order if that's possible. But thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Phillips, you have any questions? Well, I, I just echo what everybody else said. And my, my main concern is not that you know, we don't want uh, Mr. Lorenz to give us an estimated cost of what we could build. Hmm. We need an estimated cost of what we can afford to build. Yes. And that's an important. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm <laughs> relying on you to give him the guidance to say, yeah, it's got to be within this kind of a budget range, or it's right. it's it's not even worth doing the estimate. I agree. Thank you. And and and, and, and I don't want to put words in Barry's mouth, but I, Barry and I we're right there with you. I mean, that's exactly what we're we're the direction we're trying to give Mr. Wiki, and and he's there too. So it's not like we're trying to pull him kicking and screaming. Right. So I think we're all on the same page there. Absolutely, build into the budget, that's getting right. back to the basics. Okay, so I take it that everybody's good for the consent agenda. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Wick, you got consent agenda on your item there. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, board members. Uh, okay, let's move on now to uh, the policy revisions on first reading. Dr. Colleen Sane, uh, I think Dr. Shepard has talked with her, and uh, for the sake of time, what we're probably going to do is just move this on to the action agenda, and at that time, Dr. Sane will move on, uh, go through a detailed list at that time. Is that right, Dr. Sane? Absolutely. Okay, so if I have a motion that, well, we won't need a motion for that, so we'll just plan on putting 5.8 on the action agenda, and then we'll do it because it won't be as, as late maybe next time thank when you. we get together. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sane. All right. She can get us to approve anything at this yeah, point. everybody's <laughs> good for the, okay, so the, uh, the policies will be on the action agenda. All right, uh, 5.9, we have the budget amendments. Uh, Ms. Kelly uh, Klutz is going to be at the podium, and we can hear this, and we'll move right along. Okay. Um, I'll just call your attention to the, the uh, major items on the state budget amendment. There, um, there's an adjustment for early college, tra early college transportation that goes into our transportation allotment. We provide that transportation regardless. They're just basically refunding us for that um, at a separate time. And then we get our teacher orientation pay, and that's the, the big items there. Um, there is a special... Um, uh, revenue that we request for exceptional children, and so we've requested that and received that. 
um, but that hits the highlights of the state. So I'll take any questions that you have there. Okay, board members, you have any questions reference the budget amendments, Mr. Walter? So that's money already spent that we just got reimbursed for. We we are spending and we have spent and we are spending. So it'll be uh, beginning of the year to the end of the school year. But Thank you. it's based on the number of pupils we transport there. Okay, any other questions from the board? Everybody okay for consent agenda on the fifteenth? I tell y'all, you guys are tired, don't you? <laughs> okay, all right. Actually, uh, it'll be on the consent agenda for the fifteenth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Klutz. All right, the uh, next item is 5.10. This is where that uh, Dr. Shepard's gonna tell us about the, uh, the Board of Education meeting calendar and justifications for changes, if any. Dr. We, Shepard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have put together a calendar very similar to the one that you're operating under this year. Uh, the rules being that we have our work session meetings on the first Monday night and our business meeting session. Um, on the second Monday night of each month. There are exceptions. Um, we only meet once in July, so you see the July 1 date. Uh, that is the week of the 4th, but it seems that schedules make it better for the meeting to be on July 1st rather than delaying it to the next week or the next. Um, August is um, within the model that I described, so it's, excuse me, September, um, you see the September 9th date. We, we're delaying one week, both of those meetings um, due to the Labor Day holiday. In October, we're following the rule. Uh, in November, uh, the first meeting is, um, is on the first Monday night, but then there were other conflicts with uh, Veterans Day holiday on the second Monday night, and the third one is um, with your um, Greensboro meeting with the School Board Association. So the 25th, though it is the Monday night of the week of Thanksgiving, uh, it's still the the best date that we could come up with for that recommendation. December following your typical rules, January the same. Uh, notice the board retreat on Saturday, January the 11th. So uh, we can uh, go ahead and schedule that if you approve this calendar. And February, uh, again, back to standard rules. Same for March. Uh, budget work session, the extra session that we always schedule there, you can see that's listed on March 20th. Um, April standard, so is May, and um, then you can see uh, typically in June we hold a, a third late meeting, and that says budget approval. Probably is that uh, budget amendments? Yeah, budget amendment. Or that we need to change that word, Aline, from, to from instead of budget amendment and budget approval to budget amendments. But that is our recommendation. It does follow the way that you have um, uh, this board has operated for the last couple of years um, and I would say that we don't have meeting places uh, listed on this calendar so it certainly does leave open the possibility as some of you have discussed with me and um, of taking maybe our work sessions back on the road to different communities and uh, so that's you're not deciding the place or you, you actually in, in the heading it's there but it could easily be changed uh, if that's the board's wishes. So I have that for you to consider. Thank, thank you, Dr. Shepard. Board members, we have any comments on the uh, the board calendar? Yes. Mr. Walters. I sent an email earlier uh, to y'all having a couple suggestions. I mean, it's late. It's kind of 1130 almost. I've kind of lost a lot of energy on it. But uh, I think uh, it's a new board. I think it's an opportunity to do some things a little bit differently. Um, I think we could be more open um, and give folks, the community, more time to comment or review what we do at a work session prior to our business meeting. I mean, one example here is in our policy for, for the budget, you know, that we've got on the same day the budget is submitted to the board, which would be today, the superintendent will file a copy of it in his or her office where it will remain available for public inspection until the budget resolution is adopted, which is next week. You know, it doesn't give a lot of the public a lot of time to, to review or digest or any of that. And, it, and we spent, what, two, two, three hours just talking about it amongst ourselves. I mean, I think additional time or public, another public hearing after, after would, would be a good idea. Um, so I would suggest that we go back to, I think, that the board a couple of years ago had at least put two weeks between the business session, the work session and the business meetings. Um, and I also suggested maybe doing the road, the road show again is visiting some of the schools, you know, on 
Barry had come up with a good list of different sections, or what do we have, 11, 11 groupings to hit one of those, or try to go through that in a two-year period, um, just to visit all those different areas to let the folks that may not come out here that would come if we're over at Cox Mill or something, that they could come to one of our meetings. Um, what was my other thoughts? Again, suggesting maybe a joint joint uh, meeting with the Cambridge County Commissioners uh, once a year. We've had one, I guess, last year on facility needs, but something that would just keep that dialogue open in a public forum. Um, they did recently have a special meeting just to talk to the legislators. Um, so I think maybe they could they they may may or may not be open to that, but I thought a suggestion in that area anyway. Those are my comments on modifying potentially modifying our calendar. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walter. Uh, Mr. Walter, as you know, sent an email out to all the board members and I think a few to staff, and I commented on it, but I didn't hear back from anybody else. So now's your turn to tell me what you think about these ideas. One of the things that uh, another said, well, along those same lines, one of the things that we could do also in going to all the high schools, I mean, if we wanted to do a road show, basically if you went to all the high schools, you would be hitting all the areas of the county basically our high schools. Um, when I was served on the commission, that was one of the things we did. We went to the high schools, and basically when we went to the high schools, we would open our open it up for co public comment. Now that's one of the things that I've always disagreed that our board does, asking for public, making people sign up the Friday before our meetings on Monday. When all the time I was on a county commission, if you wanted to speak publicly, you signed up the night of the meeting, you filled out your little card, you got your three minutes, and that was it. Now, this board may feel completely different, but if you take the time to come to the meeting, and I think you should be able to fill out a card and speak. Now, I don't know how this board may feel completely different about that, but I feel if you put take the money and put gas in your car and you come to meet and you ought to be able to speak for three minutes. And that's just the way I feel about it. But like I say, now I have no problem with going on the road, letting people have the three minutes. And if they come, they come. And like I say, if we hit all our high schools, we would be hitting all the county. And I have no problem with it. If you want to go on the road, I have a suitcase, I'll go. And that's just the way I feel about it. <laughs> Carolyn, what, what's your thoughts on the... Uh that are ever first and second Monday, the first and third Monday. Excuse me. First and second Monday's fine with me. I mean, we, we seem to do that, uh, but I can do first and third, but first and seconds work good for us, but I have, I have no problem with it. It's what the majority of this board wants to do. Uh, I'm the long girl, but whatever, whatever the majority wants to do, I'll go along with it. Uh, uh, you know, first and second, we get it over with, and then we've got the remainder. But we've all got so many other meetings scheduled, uh, it seems to kind of leave us the last one kind of open. Uh, but I'll go with what the majority wants to do, and we can adjust, but I think we've all kind of got our schedules down. And what about the potential having a meeting with the commissioners once a year? I other, think that's a great meetings? idea. We need to, I mean, one and two, but I know their schedules are usually really tight, but I think it's great. We need to keep those lines of communications. We used to always do that, try to have one or two with the school board. Uh, I think we kind of got away from that, but we used to try to do that and try to keep it on a, a more lighter scale we used to try to do something socially with the the spouses and the board uh, to try to keep it more light uh, where we could do something uh, but I have no problem with that but uh, to, to try to try to to do that so I have no problem with that okay miss Carpenter thank you for your comments where else is the board at uh, mr. shoemaker what's your thoughts well, first off, on the uh, actual calendar, I wanted to make one comment. On the J January 13th, if you notice, you have the board retreat on the 11th. And I think there could be some deliverables out of the retreat that may not be fulfilled by the Monday the 13th. And that we would actually give ourselves one more week to, to go through. You know, sometimes in the, after we go through that, 
you know, we asked staff to go back and get some research done. And so rather than having to wait for that research to be done and I get it until February, we could postpone our meeting for a week on, on Jan in, in January, postpone it to the 20th on that particular day to allow the staff to prepare some responses from the retreat, retreat while it's still fresh on our minds. It's not a holiday for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, Make goodness a gracious. A Friday and a Saturday, too. Make it a Friday and a Saturday. Okay, so that's a holiday. I'm not conditioned for that holiday. Okay. Um, well, that, that's, that was maybe we should move the retreat up a, a week or something. But anyway, that, of course, that puts it right after y'all get back from Christmas. So another holiday. All right, so much for that. All right. Um, Oh, as far as the board meeting, the third the third week of the month is when Kannapolis City Council meets, and they meet on the first first Monday. So they meet every other Monday. So then I would never be able to be representative for us at that meeting. And unless they change their their um, their meetings, then we wouldn't have any. And I think that we're now just starting to cultivate a relationship with them that uh, I think will be advantageous and years to come um, as far as meeting with the commissioners I, I, I believe that a well, one time a year meeting with them other than a retreat wouldn't be bad but you know that's that's really their call more than it is our call we can ask but uh, you know they have a, a lot of folks on their agenda and, and we're just one of the fish in their big sea uh, so and that's where I am on thank you mr. Chairman. mr. Cogger thank you mr. chairman I, I'm I'm in favor of keeping the uh, the schedule or adopting the schedule as we have it. Um, I kind of like having the two, two the, the first and the second. And I, to me, a week's plenty of time. I, you know, I just that's just that's that's enough time to to comment and look and pay attention to what to what we're doing. Um, I, if we decide to go on the road, that's fine. I'll, I'll drive wherever we wherever we are. My concern is the 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 burden on staff, and especially I think uh, Eileen, it's a pretty big burden to to. I remember this first budget public hearing we had at Robinson, my first one outside of this room, and to see what all went in to go over there for one person. Actually, was it? Do we even have one person? We well, I think we had one, three people to talk to us. You know, and, and again, if we go somewhere and we have speakers that want to talk to us, that's that's fine. We do want that feedback, but to to you know, so I, I don't necessarily oppose it if the majority of the board decides that that's what they want to do. My my concern is just uh, the burden, the extra burden that we're putting on uh, the staff. As far as commissioners, that, that we've done it, we should do it. We can't, you know, that doesn't really have anything to do with this our particular calendar. Um, we just, you know, make the request and try to make it happen. It's certainly uh, a good idea to uh, to do. Thank you, Mr. Kiger. I agree with wholeheartedly with what you said, uh, Mr. Walters. I have yours, uh, Mr. Harrison. Uh, yeah, generally, I'm very open to the idea of, of a different location, as centrally located as, as I believe this facility is for the whole county. To some people, you know, out toward Odell, this is on the other side of the world, and just the sheer distance to them. I mean, you know, that is arduous or are uh, a, a burden. Yeah, let's um, certainly consider uh, different locations around the county. It's a very good, um, uh, uh, call it a road show if you want, but it's a good public relations approach that um, makes us more accessible um, to parents and taxpayers. Um, I do remember the Saturday retreat that we had where everyone was pitching in. I appreciate everyone pitching in, but we were pitching into poor Eileen's car of, of, <laughs> of all of the stuff that had to be, uh, uh, I'm from Moran County, drug or dragged, whatever. It had to be carried from um, here to that facility, and, and it was, um, you know, very unfair, I think, to some people <laughs> to, to um, uh have to ferry so much equipment and um, things that we take for granted and and be sure you, we get my my name tag you know whatever we do and, and carry it around that's a joke y'all it's 11 30 just we can laugh a little bit but um, do we have any conflicts in um, by, by establishing a meeting on a third Monday night do we have any conflicts with um, 
county commission meetings or other meetings. I mean, I, that would allow me to go to the Harrisburg uh, uh, Town Council for a change. So the county commission meetings sometimes would pre prevent us first and third. So um, that would prevent us from having a liaison at the county commission meetings. So, um, I mean, I think that's the big sticking point of changing uh, the dates. But, but again, generally, I'm very open to um, us being more accessible across the county. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Phillips. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I guess I'm generally in favor of, of uh, sticking with the uh, first and second Monday pattern. Uh, I do like the idea of going around, moving, uh, getting, uh, having the sessions at, at the different high schools. I think that's a great idea, Carolyn. Um, in terms of uh, asking for feedback, I think that um, a lot of people find it intimidating in this kind of a formal atmosphere to get up and speak. And I think if if what we're seeking is to get more feedback, we should consider having informal, uh, not uh, and maybe not with a quorum, um, sit-down meetings and, um, with with citizens. Um, and I, I have to ask for other people for ideas on how to do that. But I just think that whether we have it here or at a high school. Um, Average citizen is intimidated by the idea of getting up and talking to a, a group of uh, distinguished elected officials um, with the TV cameras rolling. Um, I, I just have a couple of, of, of quibbles. Um, one is October 14th. I know I'm going to have a, a business conflict on that day, but frankly, moving it another week is just as bad. So I'm probably just going to have to miss that one. Um, and then I was wondering on the in the November rather than having that six week stretch between actual voting meetings, uh, would it make sense to have um, the business meeting on the twelfth, which would be the Tuesday after Veterans Day? Is that when the, uh, the annual conference is? I don't have any days. Uh, the, uh, the annual conference is the uh, is the so following week. So we're going three weeks. It would be the 11th, then you have the 18th, that's the next Monday, and then the 25th. So I'm saying instead of waiting three weeks, could we just go to the 12th, the Tuesday? I don't know, maybe there's a conflict. Yeah. So I guess that's something to think about between now and next week. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. So we'll uh, make note of that. Uh, change there uh, and, and of course obviously it's going to go to the action agenda because of that but uh, Mr. Harrison you have another comment uh, just a, a quick comment that whenever we do get to the point where we're making a decision on this we may need two separate votes one for the two days of two nights of the month and a separate one for locations so if we can keep those votes separate we might be able to facilitate making decisions well I kept record by golly, I you, always you, keep you, record. You, 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 and it looks to me like you know, got us down. first and second Monday, it's pretty much consensus of the board, except for Mr. Walter, which was his idea to rotate, is that uh, we've got six members that said they want to leave it like it is. And then, as far as the meetings with the commissioners, I think pretty much everybody agrees that that's a good idea. But then, like Mr. Shoemaker said, I think it'll be their call. So all pretty much all we can do is just. Uh, right to the county uh, we'll ask dr shepherd to draft up a letter to uh, mike downs and ask if we can somehow squeeze in an additional meeting for a couple of hours with our board and their board in a public forum to discuss issues of concern so we got pretty much consensus on that but as far as the uh, moving to other schools for the meetings the best that i could keep record of we had uh, you see david and jeff and carolyn that said that uh, that they were okay with going to other schools to have the uh, meetings, the work sessions. So it looks to be only got three that will support that. Rob, 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 yeah, because I, I, I forgot to put you down because this was your idea. Okay, so that's four. It looks like we got four. And I, I didn't say anything. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. I got to drive across the county, so if I got to get to drive to Northwest one time, that would be great. Yeah. Well, I think I think Carolyn had the good idea though, because our high schools are centrally located, 
and you know I think it would. We only got seven high schools, seven. We can get. We, well, but anyway, the scheduling that that could be determined, but. Um, that's where we're at, though. So the first and second Mondays will stay as it is, and then we'll try to get a meeting with the commissioners once a year, just for a hey, how you doing? Get together and discuss some issues in a in a, a different type uh, forum, as Carolyn suggested, and then uh, we'll just schedule some of the uh, work sessions in various high schools. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So that's how we'll leave it, but it will go to the action agenda anyway for a further discussion or whatever between now and then. So. Is everybody okay with that? All right, we're good. Like you check on the twelfth. Yes, the 12th, yes, and please yeah, check that on. Seems yeah, like a good idea. yeah, and please check on the, the November the twelfth versus the twenty fifth that we have down now. All right, the last item on the agenda tonight is the approval to submit training hours uh, to the North Carolina School Board Association for Carolyn Carpenter. She attended the North Carolina Head Start Association forty third annual conference in Raleigh on March the 13th through the 15th. And at that particular meeting, Carolyn earned an additional nine hours. And based on um, uh, my reading and my study, you know, the way the North Carolina School Board Association wants us to do now is that whenever we have members that have continuing education beyond uh, the 12 hours that's required, uh, that they want the board to approve it. So. Uh, unless anybody has any questions or concerns. I mean, I know Carolyn was there because Rob and myself and Barry were there and uh, for the uh, meeting with the legislators that day. So Carolyn was there and uh, she did good representation for our board at the Head Start convention there in Raleigh. So are there any discussion on this or is everybody okay for the consent agenda to get her hours sent in? Everybody good? Yep. Okay, Carolyn, you get your hours, you get credit for it. And then uh, we, we took care of 5.12. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that being said, I need a motion that motion this meeting be adjourn. adjourned. I second. All right, Mr. Shoemaker makes the motion. Ms. Carpenter seconds the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, okay, the motion carries. The board uh, is now adjourned. And I want to say good night to everyone, and we'll see you back on the 15th here at the Ed Center. Thank you for joining in with us tonight. Good night.